Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Raja Ram. I am a pediatrician working with Rainbow Children's Hospital, Marathalli, Bangalore. So today, I will be discussing about a very common topic. So gastroenteritis, also called as food poisoning. So I decided to speak about this topic because of three main reasons. This is one of the commonest reason for hospital visits amongst children. Even though it is very common, parents find it very difficult to manage this. Parents are okay managing fever, parents are okay managing cough cold. But when it comes to diarrhea, parents find it very difficult. Thirdly, there are a lot of misconceptions, a lot of myths about uh, the treatment of uh, food poisoning. I wanted to discuss about uh, these things as well. So what is food poisoning? Basically, it is an infection of your child's gut, which comprises of the stomach, the intestines, both small as well as large intestines. What causes food poisoning? When your child eats or drinks food or liquids contaminated with microorganisms or toxins produced by the microorganisms, the child's gut gets infected and the infection will lead to destruction of the lining of the gut. So, what are the common organisms which cause food poisoning? There are variety of microorganisms, viruses, bacteria, parasites, fungi, but the commonest subgroup is viruses. So, when your child eats or drinks contaminated food or when your child is having bottle feeds and the bottle hygiene is not maintained or your child has habit of mouthing. Mouthing is basically your child keeps your keeps her hands on the floor or toys and the same hands go into his or her mouth. The infection starts. So as soon as the toxin or the microorganism enters the gut, it starts damaging the lining of the gut as I said. When this happens, the three major function of, functions of the gut is altered. What are the three major functions? The gut is supposed to digest or break down the food particles and it has to absorb the good nutrients and then it has to excrete the waste products. So when there is damage to the linings, all three functions are altered then your child starts developing symptoms. Depending on the type of organism or the type of toxin, it may take anywhere between half an hour to two days for your child to start developing symptoms. But there are certain viruses like hepatitis A, which may take easily two to three weeks to start developing the symptoms. So now, what are the symptoms of gastroenteritis? So most commonly, it is vomiting, and loose tools, but your child might also develop fever, pain abdomen or tummy pain and if it is a bacterial infection, your child might also have blood in stools, lot of pain abdomen, pain when passing urine, lot of mucus in the stool and the stool might be foul smelling as well. And as the illness progresses, your child might also develop features of dehydration, your child might feel very tired and the urine output also may come down. Depending on the type of virus, a child might also develop respiratory symptoms like cough or cold or a rash because of the primary pathogen. So what is the dreaded complication of gastroenteritis? So it is dehydration which basically gives rise to all problems. So when we don't pick up gastroenteritis or food poisoning initially and we don't manage it appropriately initially, your child might develop dehydration. When dehydration sets in, the blood supply to different organs of the body might get hampered like the kidney, liver, heart or brain. So the blood supply to these vital organs is altered. Because of that, there can be end organ damage. What are the signs of dehydration? When your child develops dehydration, your child might become very irritable 
or very lethargic or drowsy. Child's eyes may be sunken. When your child is crying, there may not be tears. Lips will be very dry. Oral mucosa might become very dry. The skin turgor may be very poor. Skin turgor, how do you check skin turgor? You pinch your child's skin over the tummy and then leave it like this. If the skin goes back quickly like this, it may be an indication that your child is not dehydrated. If you pinch and then leave it and if it goes back very slowly like this, it is an indication that your child is dehydrated. So when should you be visiting a pediatrician? So as I discussed, if your child has features of dehydration, definitely you will have to visit your pediatrician. If your child has blood in stools, you definitely have to visit your pediatrician. Or if there is high grade fever or persistent fever, you have to visit your pediatrician. If your child's hand and feet are cold, then yes, you will have to visit your pediatrician. So these are the danger signs or red flags associated with food poisoning. So let's move on to the treatment or management of food poisoning. So most of the children who develop food poisoning can be managed at home provided you know how to give the right treatment. The first and foremost thing is giving adequate liquids. Just think what your child is losing because of vomiting and blue stones. It is the water, the nutrients and the electrolytes, sodium and potassium. If you replace these things, the chances of your child developing dehydration is very rare. So how do you replace these things, water, electrolytes and uh, glucose? First thing you can give home based liquids, you can give coconut water, Soups you can give, water, and apart from that you can also give ORS. ORS is basically oral rehydration solution. This comes as a powder which contains glucose as well as electrolyte, electrolytes like sodium and potassium. You have to mix this in water, the right amount of water and then you will have to give your child. There are variety of ORS formulations available in the market. The commonest ones are 4.4 gram sachet. This is a small sachet. There is one more sachet which is 22 gram. So I don't have it with me right now. So, But uh, it comes as a bigger sachet. If it is a 4.4 gram sachet like this, you have to mix this sachet in 200 ml of water. If it is a 22 gram sachet, you have to mix it in 1 liter of water. If the dilution is not appropriate, then there are chances that either you are giving more electrolytes, more sodium and more glucose or less of glucose and the electrolytes. And it may be dangerous to give under diluted or over diluted uh, ORS. So once you prepare the ORS solution, you, you have to use it within 24 hours. If you have to give ORS the next day, you will have to discard the previous day's ORS and then prepare a fresh formulation and then give it. How much ORS to give? If your child is less than 2 months, you can give 5 spoonfuls of ORS. If your child, if your child is between two, years, 2 months to 2 years, you can give 1 fourth of a cup of ORS. If your child is between 2 years to 10 years, you can give half to 1 cup of ORS which is about 200 ml. If your child is more than 10 years, you can give ad lib as much as your child wants. So there is another thing which is available, another ORS formulation which is available as Tetra Pak. So personally, I wouldn't advise this because the electrolyte contents of these Tetra Paks are very variable and many times you can land up in complications because of the abnormal electrolyte content. So it is always good to give the ORS powder which is 4.4 grams or 22 grams. If suppose you don't have access to the pharmacy, you don't get ORS sachets, what to do? You can prepare ORS at home. How do you prepare it? You have to take 1 liter of water, add 6 spoons of salt, sorry, 6 spoons of sugar and uh, half a spoon of uh, salt and mix it and use it like ORS. 
so ors is like sanjeevini it is very important this is one of the most important things to be given in uh, uh, diary so apart from this if you look at the who world health organization guidelines they say the other mandatory medicine which has to be given in uh, gastroenteritis is zinc so zinc does three things one is it will reduce the severity of the illness it will reduce the duration of illness it will also reduce the chances of recurrence of diarrheal illness during the next 3 months so that is why it is very important that you give zinc for 2 weeks if your child develops vomiting you have to give medicines to stop vomiting once the vomiting stops your child's oral intake will improve and then dehydration also gets better If your child has fever, you have to give fever medicines, specifically paracetamol. Other drugs are not very safe, especially if your child is having uh, diarrhea or vomiting. So it is always good to give uh, paracetamol, and it has to be given only when the temperature is more than hundred. Uh, many times we see that children develop lot of rashes around the in a perianal area because of loose motions. It is very common. If your child develops rashes. you have to keep the perianal area very dry and open and avoid using diapers as much as possible and you will have to apply either coconut oil or creams which are based on zinc and when you apply this cream it has to be applied like a thick paste so that it forms a barrier between the rash and the motion or urine so what happens if you don't apply it as a thick paste whenever your child passes urine or motion it falls on the rash and it creates lot of pain and burning sensation so that is why it is very important that you apply it like a thick paste it will also prevent friction and the rash starts healing faster the rash usually takes anywhere between 3 to 5 days to heal and let's talk about uh, the diet many parents ask me what diet is to be followed what is not to be given so diet basically we have to give more liquids as i discussed earlier home based fluids plus ors apart from that you can give soft diet rice based or ragi based you give small portions more frequently don't give too much at a time your child might vomit if you give too much at a time and then avoid giving carbonated drinks caffeinated drinks avoid giving glucose water because excess glucose in these liquids will only increase the loose tone so these things are not to be given avoid giving spicy food avoid giving non vegetarian food avoid giving hard to digest food avoid giving oily foods so let's move on to the next sub group of uh, uh, medicines so these medicines it is okay to give okay not to give also so there are two uh, medicines in this group one the first one is the probiotic the rationale for giving probiotics is with loose stools you tend to lose the good bacteria that are there in your gut so you are basically replacing the lost bacteria through probiotics there is another medicine called resica dotter this medicine is supposed to reduce the stool volume and thereby reduce the stool frequency but at this point there is no definite evidence to say that these two medicines have to be definitely given for all children so the next group of medicines so i say avoid giving these medicines what are they so in adults they give few medicines like loperamide to stop the loose stools so in children that should not be done it is dangerous to do so because whatever infection is there it has to come out if you try to stop it there is a chance that the infection persists and it will only get prolonged and it will lead to other complications there are other medicines like antispasmodics again these are not to be given they again lead to lot of complications not to be given and uh, if your child has fever as i said earlier you give only paracetamol don't give 
medicines like meftal don't give medicines like ibuprofen because they increase the increase the chances of vomiting when your child continues to vomit like this there is a chance that the dehydration will worsen and there is a rare chance that the kidneys also get affected so it is better to avoid these medicines use only paracetamol if your child has the uh, food poison for the rash there are lot of creams available in the market zinc containing medicines you have to use but there are other things which contain antibiotics antifungals and steroid creams it is better to avoid these kind of medicines so if your child has blood in stools or high grade fever it may be an indication that your child is having a bacterial food poisoning the pediatrician will decide whether or not to give antibiotic for your child depending on whether it is bacterial or viral so what is the anticipated course of illness usually if it is a viral illness it will take between anywhere between 3 to 5 days if it is bacterial it might take little longer time the first thing to get better in gastroenteritis is vomiting because the microorganism entered your body through the mouth it basically affects the stomach to begin with and then it trickles down the intestine so first thing is vomiting and first thing to get better is also vomiting and then the fever will start coming down especially if it is a viral infection and then gradually the oral intake will improve the activity and general condition will also improve the last thing to get better is loose tooth remember it will take easily 5 to 7 days very rarely beyond 7 days and if it is a different pathologic phenomena like persistent diarrhea or chronic diarrhea the loose tooths might last for more than 2 weeks also so this is the anticipated course so remember that loose tooths are the last thing last thing to get better so even if you give medicines loose tooths are not going to subside then moving on to the mimickers of uh, food poisoning so there are two three clinical conditions which mimic food poisoning the first one is urinary tract infection in young children urinary tract infection resembles food poisoning the clinical features are very similar your child will have same fever vomiting loose tooth but what is atypical is that fever will continue to be there even after day 3 it may be high grade and your child will look even sicker so if your child's fever is lasting for more than 3 days and if it is very high grade or if your child is very young you have to definitely visit a pediatrician and if needed urine has to be tested to see whether it is urinary infection or not the second common thing is uh, interception interception is basically one part of your child's uh, intestine goes into another part of your child's intestine and then this part of the intestine the blood supply is hampered and uh, there is a chance that this part of the intestine the uh, blood supply is hampered and it gets damaged so this is an emergency so what are the clinical features which say that it is interception in interception a child will be very irritable and there may be blood in stools and in older children they say there is a lot of pain tummy pain so these features should alert you that it could be interception and you have to meet your pediatrician and your pediatrician will take a decision whether to do a tummy ultrasound or not if there is interception there is a procedure called pneumatic reduction it's not a surgery they just you know detangle the intestine the third uh, mimicker is uh, food protein allergies cow's milk protein allergy or gluten allergy gluten hypersensitivity it's called celiac disease so these things again the symptoms will be prolonged and your doctor will do specific tests to diagnose uh, these kind of uh, clinical conditions so moving on to the prevention of gastroenteritis how do we prevent uh, gastroenteritis see if you are child is breastfed please continue breastfeeding do not stop it do not change to something else because the breast milk has 
immunological factors which prevent your child from contracting the food poisoning. And if your child is bottle fed, you make sure you follow the proper bottle hygiene. You make sure you separate all parts of the bottle and then boil it before giving a feed. And as much as possible, avoid eating outside food. And then also you maintain proper hand hygiene before you uh, prepare food, you'll have to wash your hands. After changing the diapers, you'll have to wash your hands thoroughly. And apart from that, there are two specific vaccines, rotaviral vaccine and the measles vaccine, which are to be definitely given. So they basically prevent uh, the diarrheal episodes, especially the rotaviral vaccine. So if you look at the data amongst uh, viral gastroenteritis, this is the commonest uh, organism, rotavir rotavirus, which causes uh, gastroenteritis. The government has already started giving it free of cost in uh, certain parts of the country. Hopefully, uh, this starts in all the states of our country. So measles anyways is already part of the national immunization program. So it has to be given definitely starting from nine months of age. So just to summarize our discussion, gastroenteritis, it is a very common infection. The most dreaded thing in gastroenteritis is the most dreaded complication is dehydration. So you keep giving fluids and ORS as I discussed earlier. And if your child is breastfed, please continue it. Do not stop it. If your child is on cow's milk or formula feeds, you please continue it. You don't have to stop it. And also make sure that you give vaccinations according to the age. And the main aim of diarrhea management is prevention of dehydration by giving more liquids. And if your child has any danger signs or red flags as discussed, please go and meet your pediatrician immediately. So now, let's, let's move on to the questions. So there is one question, what is the process of clinical evaluation? So not all children will require a clinical, eval uh, a clinical evaluation. If your child is not dehydrated, it is okay, you can manage your child at home. If your child is uh, dehydrated, definitely you have to come to the hospital and we look at the signs of uh, dehydration. Then if your child is dehydrated, then we will have to do a couple of blood tests to see whether your child's electrolytes, sugar content, all that is okay. And if you are suspecting uh, atypical uh, things, we will have to do investigations accordingly. So there is one more question. Should we go for blood tests when a child develops food poisoning? Not always, as I told you earlier. So there is one parent who says, Doc, my kids are 11 and 13 now and I give endrogermina followed by soft diet like idli, curd rice, what should I give once I, once I see loose tools and vomiting? Settle. Can you tell how zinc can be given? What about fruits? What should I give once I see loose tools and vomiting? So as I said, the loose tools, no medicine. Vomiting, you can give uh, either Ondem or MS, one of the antiemetics which contain Ondensetron. Uh, so zinc has to be given uh, once a day, it is a syrup as I said and it has to be given for a total of 14 days. Suppose your child gets better after uh, 3 to 4 days of uh, giving zinc, you still have to continue it. You have to complete the course of uh, zinc. What about fruits? It is okay to give fruits. It is good to give fruits but don't give fruit juice especially with extra sugar. So if you give extra sugar that will only worsen the loose tooth. There is one more parent who says, is it okay to stop zinc after five days once the child is better? Yes. As I said, you have to complete the course of um, uh, zinc, which is for 14 days. So there is one more question. Can dehydration be a major cause? Yes. If 
the dehydration is not picked up earlier and if it is not managed properly it can be a major thing yes so Seeing if there are any more questions. So, if there are any more questions, you can put it in the chat box. I'll answer it later. So. So I'll end this uh, discussion at this point. Thank you so much. Yeah.